thank you for joining us once again. Welcome to Grace. Uh, as we continue our study of the judgment seat of Christ, we want to return today to what the Apostle Paul called our patience of hope, the, the believer's patience of hope. Every believer's patience of hope will be open to the building inspector's evaluation at the judgment that will take place at Christ's appearing, Paul tells us. And that building, once again, is called the body of Christ. And God had this building in mind before the foundation of the world, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. God's plan was to take all the believers of all the ages, otherwise called the household of faith in the Bible, uh, and join those believers in a spiritual oneness to the person of his son. A judicial oneness. This joining of believers to the Son of God would take place after Christ had fulfilled all righteousness and therefore at the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that, that Christ was raised again for our justification. So let's take a quick look at that passage. It's Romans chapter 4, verse 25. We're speaking of Jesus Christ. Paul went on to say, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. And the Bible goes on to tell us there that justification by faith. So we are not made righteous apart from faith. The word justification is a translation taken from the Greek uh, root word, dekeyao. Uh, a dictionary of the Greek defines that word this way, to render, meaning to show or regard as just or innocent, to be righteous. Uh, so they go on with the right definition there. But the Greek word translated just is the same Greek word translated righteous in the King James Bible. They're synonyms. Uh, to be just is to be righteous and vice versa. Why did God plan to join his household of faith to the person of his son in this spiritual union relationship? We actually did so for two reasons, two major reasons, and you should know both of them. Very important. Reason number one, which I think everyone's probably familiar with, it was for the purpose of making us righteous or being able to count us righteous. What belongs to one in a union relationship belongs to the other. Uh, joint property laws, it used to be called. So God, by joining us to his son, could legally call us as righteous as his son and not be lying. He's totally truthful because the righteousness belonging to his son was the only righteousness God could accept and accept believers who are practically... We're always unrighteous when it comes to measuring up to the degree of God's righteousness. As most of you know, justification is not a type of righteous standing before uh, God that man deserves, not a righteousness he is capable of earning by way of any performance he might be able to muster on his own. It does not come by way of adhering to any list of, of rules and regulations. No list of do's and don'ts would work, no matter how uh, much you dedicated yourself to obey them. Um, because this righteousness goes far beyond the capacity of any man to achieve. The gift decree of righteousness that God had in mind by joining believers to his son is the righteousness that belongs to God himself. And I think we all agree that none of us measure up to that degree of righteousness. How do we know that no man is capable of meriting a righteous standing before God by way of his performance? Um, John pointed that out when he made this statement, a statement we shouldn't find all that surprising. In John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love hath no man, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, being willing to die for those we love is something men talk about, uh, something most men would say they're willing to do, and something we know that men are capable of doing because men have done so. Um, however, willing, willingly accepting a death penalty by standing in the place of an enemy who has been sentenced to die for a crime he's committed against you or a family member of yours is something you'll, you'll never read about in the newspaper. You'll never hear about it on the news. Um, yet that's precisely what Christ did when he bore the sins of mankind upon itself at Calvary and bore the wrath those sins deserved. Paul revealed the extent of God's love for man in two verses in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 10, where he stated these words, and we'll put them back to back for you. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Look at verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Reconciliation didn't require a wait on God's part to see if you'd have faith. He reconciled the world unto himself while the world was still his enemies. In fact, we hadn't even drawn a breath when he took our sins and died for those sins. 
So we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, and if that took place when we were enemies, much more being reconciled, having been reconciled with continuing results, we shall be saved by his life. We have to be joined to the resurrection life of Christ legally in order to have life ourselves. And that joining is done by the Holy Spirit the moment we believe in what Christ accomplished when he took our sins away at Calvary. We can thank the Lord that God's love is, goes far beyond any love that we have for God. He didn't love us because he knew that deep down inside, mankind really does have a love for him. Uh, the truth is, God knew all along that deep down in the hearts of humankind resi uh, resides a desire to, to satisfy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and what the Bible calls the pride of life. And that goes far beyond our love for God, believe it or not. Uh, so a major reason why God's plan called for believers to be joined to the person of his son in a, a spiritual oneness, a union relationship, uh, the one that I've been talking about was for the purpose of being able to credit believers with a gift decree of being righteous. Not a righteousness we earn, but a gift decree. And that righteousness belongs to his very son. So when he sees us, believers, sinful believers, he sees the person of his son. It's an amazing thing that God did. But there's more. Gifting believers with a judicial decree of being as righteous as the one to whom God has joined those believers is the first reason. And it's only the first reason why the union relationship called the body of Christ was a part of God's master plan. There's an even more astounding reason for joining believers to Christ, if we really want to contemplate this. The this, this second reason had to do with the building that God was planning as his own dwelling place. The second reason needs a little more explanation. You may recall the story of the tabernacle. We talked about this earlier on in our, in our uh, journey through the Bible. It was a portable tent. The tabernacle was a portable tent that Moses was told to construct in the wilderness. The Hebrew word translated tabernacle means a residence or a dwelling place. Uh, it's called the tabernacle or the tent of the congregation in your Bible. And it's also called the tent of meeting in scripture because that portable structure was designed to demonstrate the Lord's presence with the, with the people of the nation. He was actually present in that tabernacle. Here it is in Exodus chapter 29 verse 43. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Do you remember when Moses asked God to show him his glory? Moses wanted to see God. No man's seen God at any time, the Bible tells us. But Moses asked to see God, and God showed him his glory, but just a tiny part of that glory. Uh, and in that glory was nothing more than an explanation to Moses of his attributes. So God is spirit. No man has seen God at any time. But God's glory, who God is, in essence as a spirit being, was present in the tabernacle. And it's, it's an amazing thing. God would meet with the children of Israel by way of the high priest of that nation. Within that tabernacle was an inner sanctum of sorts called the Holy of Holies, otherwise known as the most holy place of all. The, uh, the holy of, holiest place within the tabernacle. It was there in the Holy of Holies uh, section of the tabernacle that the Lord would meet with Israel's high priest one time every year. And that high priest was to sprinkle the blood of a sacrificial goat before and upon the mercy seat that was upon the box, we could call it the lid of the chest, uh, called the Ark of the Covenant, uh, to make atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. In the Holy of Holies, the high priest would represent the, the people to God, and he would be representing God to the people. Uh, as God spoke to that high priest, the high priest could relay God's words to the people. Uh, God wanted the people to know. Uh, the reason for this meeting was he wanted the people to know that he was present there with them as his glory was abiding in the tabernacle. We read about that glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35. Let's take a quick look. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Can you imagine the sight of that? As this was taking place and Moses couldn't even go in, um, when Moses asked earlier to see God's glory, what did his face do when he came down? It was shining so brightly they couldn't come anywhere near him. They were afraid of him. Um, so 
Can you imagine this cloud that was in the tabernacle, the brightness of it in Moses? And, and the high priest, Moses here, uh, not the high priest, but Moses was not able to enter the tent of the congregation. The tent tabernacle was replaced later on, as we know, by Solomon's temple around 960 B.C. Later would come Zerubbabel's temple and still later King Herod's temple that was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the armies of Titus, as some of you know. But again, within Solomon's temple was a place called the Holy of Holies with its mercy seat and the two golden cherubim placed at the two ends of that mercy seat. And the mercy seat, as I said earlier, was the lid of the chest called the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Covenant. Solomon's temple was the only temple, by the way, interesting point, that contained the Ark of, Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Solomon's temple. And we're going to see why in, a little later on. Just keep in mind that both the tabernacle and later Solomon's temple were designed by God himself to demonstrate God's presence, a place of his own dwelling, as he said, a residence for God with the people of Israel. Now, the Bible tells us that the temple was located in Jerusalem, which happened to be the capital city uh, of the nation since the days of King David. Notice the words of the psalmist in Psalms 132, verses 13 and 14. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. Uh, he hath desired it for his, next word, habitation, place for him to dwell. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So the Lord would be present, the Lord would be among his people as his presence was filling the tabernacle. But then in the book of Ezekiel, we see something interesting beginning to happen in regard to the dwelling place of the Lord. Ezekiel was speaking for God in Ezekiel chapter 9, the prophet, verse 9, where Ezekiel said, Then said he unto me, God speaking to Ezekiel, tell the people, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. And the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Interestingly enough, King Solomon was the very first of the kings to introduce idolatry. And he did so on a major scale. Uh, we looked at the story of the idolatrous kings um, in an earlier part of our journey through the Bible. But the priesthood in that day was as equally corrupt as were some of the kings. It was now time for God to do something, and that something he was going to do was depart his dwelling place. He was going to depart the temple. His dwelling place uh, uh, would no longer be the place where he would abide. E Ezekiel depicted the beginning of his departure in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses three, or verse 3, rather, in chap uh, chapter 10, verse 4, two sections here. Watch God begin to move and to move away from where he was dwelling among the people. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Remember, they were on the two ends of the, of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, located in the Holy of Holies, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. Long story, that's another study. We'll not go there today. The word translated threshold means entrance. The entrance of the temple was the courtyard. So notice Ezekiel's words here in chapter 10, verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Can you see the progressive movement here as the glory of the Lord is departing the place of his dwelling? He left the Holy of Holies as he moved from above the ark in the most holy place to the entrance of the temple courtyard, as we just read. Then we see a further departure as he's moving on further out and, and away from his dwelling place in the temple. Here it is in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. Can you see it there? So it's an amazing thing that's happening here as we see God beginning to leave his dwelling place among men. Obviously, the cherubim, category of angelic being, most scholars believe, were departing along with the Lord. They were leaving also. <laughs> the departure is fully underway at this point. Verse 19 continues the withdrawal process. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight, Ezekiel saying, when they went out. The wheels also were beside them. The wheels is another interesting uh, prophetic verse. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the Lord of Lord of God of Israel, rather, was over them above. So the glory of God began in the Holy of Holies, 
Then we saw the move to the entrance of the temple courtyard. It then moved from the entrance of the temple courtyard to the door of the east gate of the temple complex. Then in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, we see a further movement, a further progression of the departure of the glory of God from the place of God's dwelling place, uh, his dwelling, as we see him move from the midst of the city to the east side of the city. So let's follow that account. Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Would anybody happen to know the name of that mountain which was on the east side of the city, the place where the glory of the Lord departed to before the glory of the Lord ascended back up to heaven? Anyone know that mountain name? It's called the Mount of Olives, by the way. Isn't that interesting? On the east side of the city is the Mount of Olives. We're left to assume that from the Mount of Olives, the glory of the Lord ascended back into the third heaven. Uh, this account by Ezekiel goes hand in hand with the prophecy of an earlier prophet, and that prophet's name was Hosea. Notice Hosea's words in Hosea chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. It was time for judgment. And what had the prophet Ezekiel just said about Israel? Full of perverseness. So I will tear and I'm going to do what? I'm going to go away. Hosea was to tell them, I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place. Till, until what? Until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. So the glory of the Lord left the Holy of Holies in the earthly temple of Solomon, where God, all capital letters here, where the Lord, had been dwelling among the people of Israel. However, Hosea had prophesied that the Lord would return to his place until, until Israel acknowledged her offense, the offense of having sworn falsely when they said, give us this law and we'll do every bit of it. You can count us righteous to the degree that we do it. And so until Israel would make their law failure confession, the law failure nation had to make their law failure confession. Until they did that, uh, God wouldn't answer them any longer. But the Lord did indeed return to his place, the third heaven. But where had the glory of God been dwelling before that? Before that time, it had been dwelling in the temple until departing the temple. Follow the timeline now. As we have, we've been studying this timeline, Jesus Christ, the word that had been with God and the word that was God, according to John's gospel, came to the earth to dwell among men, did he not? And the second member of the Godhead would actually take on flesh, being born of the Virgin Mary, and the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, again, would reveal this truth to Joseph prior to the birth of the Christ child. Many of our listeners know where to find this passage in the Bible. It's Matthew chapter 1, where Joseph was being told not to fear because his wife had not been unfaithful. She'd not been an unfaithful wife. She'd been true to him all the time. They were in the espousal period of their marriage relationship. They would have needed to divorce had anything changed because they were legally husband and wife, but they'd not come together. That espousal was still underway. So Mary was bearing a child through a supernatural conception that had been brought about by the Holy Ghost himself. Mary hadn't been an unfaithful wife in any sense of the word. Notice Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, where we find the words being spoken to Joseph. Here they are. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Where was he? He was in the temple. <laughs> and then he departed. And then Christ came, giving Israel that opportunity to make their law failure con uh, confession. And now... They're calling Christ God with us. God is with Israel again, but how so? Through the second member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. He'd return to his place, just like Hosea prophesied when it came to dwelling among men. God was out of there. <laughs> we followed the account of the glory of God departing Solomon's temple where God had been dwelling from the completion of the construction of the tent tabernacle in the wilderness all the way up until the departure of the glory of God from Solomon's temple. So God was no longer dwelling among men. He would return to his place, as the prophet said, until Israel would be called upon to make her law failure confession. As we all know well, God provided that opportunity for the nation Israel 
through John's baptism of a change of thinking that God wanted to see from his law contract nation a repentance, which simply means a change of mind, a change of thinking. And that change of thinking for the law contract nation was to be expressed through John's water rite called John's baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Israel's sins. They were the law contract nation. It wasn't a require. I mean, it wasn't a, a testimony. It wasn't something you could do or not do. It wasn't something that was a picture of something else. It was actually the way they were to confess that they had not obeyed the law contract that God had placed them under. God placed no other nation under a law contract, folks. Israel was the only nation. Israel's a law contract nation. This is the only time in your Bible where you're going to see confession of sins. It was for the nation because they had contracted not to commit any sins. Their far forefathers had made that promise uh, that the nation would never commit any sins. They would be righteous according to the law. The glory of the Lord had departed the temple. Then the Christ child, the second member of the Godhead, came to earth to dwell among men. Uh, it was only appropriate that his name be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. Listen to John in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word, the word that John had said was with God and was indeed God, was made flesh. And catch this dwelt among us. Do you see God again among his people, but now through the second member of the Godhead. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God was dwelling among men once again. But this time, it would be by way of the second member of the, a member of the Godhead, the God-man, Jesus Christ. The unfortunate thing for the Israelites of that day is found in John's statement of John chapter, in John chapter 1 and verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own did what? <laughs> Received him not. What happened as far as God dwelling with mankind after the cross of Calvary? Can anybody tell me what happened there? You all know. We know that Christ, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the one who was named Emmanuel, meaning God is with us, ascended back into heaven. From where in Jerusalem did the God-man depart the earth? It gets interesting, folks. You should have an idea at this time. The answer is from the same place God's glory departed the temple, from the Mount of Olives. The very same location where the glory of God returned to heaven after departing Solomon's temple. Guess where he's coming back? <laughs> the same exact place. So the glory of the Lord God, the Father, that is, departed the temple, returned unto his place in heaven, the third heaven the Bible tells us. Then when the second member of the Godhead came to dwell among men on earth, they refused to accept him as their Messiah, Instead of accepting him for who he, he truly is, his identity, the Christ, the son of the living God, who had risen from the dead, they crucified him. And then after spending 40 days with him, after his, that resurrection, the second member of the Godhead departed from among men and ascended back into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. This brings us to the second reason that God's plan, his master plan, called for God the Holy Spirit to join all believers to the person of his son in a one flesh union relationship called baptism or immersion, not into H2O at all, but into the risen, ascended God, Lord himself rather, uh, Jesus Christ. So this is called baptism into Christ. It's another baptism. There are, there are 13 baptisms in scripture. This is another one. And Paul said this is the only one for today. So this baptism, immersion, is not into water. It's into the person of Jesus Christ himself. And it's a spiritual operation performed by the Holy Spirit at the point of every person's belief. Paul spoke of it in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, where he said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Again, we all know. He's the second member of the Godhead. Jesus is God. Is God actually dwelling among men today is the question. The answer is yes. He is. Once again. But he's doing so through the house of the Lord called the body of Christ. Uh, every member of the body of Christ is indwelt by the Holy Spirit according to our apostle. The interesting thing is that Paul talks about the believer's union with Christ in Ephesians chapter 2 where he mentions the special temple that was created by this union of believers with Christ. Let's pick it up in uh, chapter 2 verse, verses 19 and 20 which should be a very familiar passage to those following our studies. Here Paul was speaking to Gentiles who were who Gentiles who had been willing to believe Paul's gospel. 
Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Nowhere in earthly kingdom prophecy has it ever been stated that the Gentiles would become fellow citizens with the saints of the earthly kingdom promise in that God's household of faith would comprise both Jewish and Gentile believers. You're not going to find that in the pages of prophecy. Uh, it was prophesied that Gentiles would be coming into Jerusalem. You'll read about that. As Christ will one day be ruling and reigning in righteousness while sitting on the throne of David in a new temple that will exist in that location in time future. Hear that. We'll read about that in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 and 7. Also the sons of the stranger, these are Gentiles, that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. That covenant was the law of Moses. So in that day, while the law was still underway, you could take hold of the covenant. You could convert to Judaism, which meant, meant you'd have to go through the circumcision and abide by all the rules and regulations of the law. You'd have to claim that law for yourselves. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called in house of prayer for all people. A literal, physical temple during the future millennial reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. A time when Christ will be sitting on the throne of David and Gentiles will be taking hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, according to the prophets, uh, saying, we will go with you. <laughs> For we have heard that God is with you. Uh, it was a matter of earthly kingdom prophecy. It was known. It was spelled out. Therefore, that was certainly not something that God had been keeping secret until he revealed it to the apostle Paul to make known to all men. That was a matter of earthly kingdom prophecy, as we said. However, a spiritual temple a spiritual dwelling place for God on the earth during this present dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God, a spiritual temple, <coughs> pardon me, comprising believing Jews and Gentiles. Now where in the pages of earthly kingdom prophecy do you find anything like that? The answer is you won't, you won't find anything like that because it doesn't exist. This is a different type of temple altogether. Speaking of the spiritual building, the Apostle Paul had had just said that all Gentile believers are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now watch what Paul adds to that message in verses 21 and 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto, and here it is, an holy temple in the Lord. You see it? In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God, through the Spirit. Now it's the third member of the Godhead dwelling among men. Where's the third member of the Godhead dwell? Inside a temple called the body of Christ. Be, by joining the household of faith, Jewish Gentile believers alike, to the person of his Son, the risen ascended Lord of glory, God would be providing for himself an holy temple in the Lord, as Paul's just told us. But in this case, it is a living temple. It's a holy habitation or dwelling place for God through the Spirit. That living temple is called the body of Christ, folks. That's what the second reason, not only to justify believers, but now to make those believers be a holy habitation for God through the Holy Spirit. God has made every believer, though, a crew member, as we've been talking about, as every believer has a responsibility, every believer has a role to play in the building up of this unprophesied living temple. Uh, Paul told us that we are fitly framed together there in chapter 2, verse 21. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, he tells us that we're fitly joined together, fitly framed together, fitly joined together. I'm sure you're well aware of this passage, but here it is once again, because I want you to notice an interesting word that Paul used here, and I didn't call it to your attention, attention before. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. That's the word I want to point out and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, that's every, every saved person, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The word translated compacted is the Greek sumbirazo, of which the expression knit together 
is included in the definition of uh, uh, the definition given by a dictionary of the Greek language. Is that not interesting? We are knit together. This may give the ladies who do knitting, uh, they may get a better feel for the impact of what Paul's telling us here. We men have to study it a little more closely. But the knitting process has to do with interweaving, or we might say interlocking, the various yarn loops such that each additional loop makes an entire structure. It makes that structure stronger. Knitted fabric consists of a number of consecutive rows of interlocking loops. And I had to look this up because I had no idea. We have people right here who could probably tell you way more about this. This is what God's building project and the part that every member is to contribute in this living temple structure is all about according to the picture that Paul's just painted for us by his use of the word sumirazo, knitted together. It's about building up and making the entire structure stronger rather than pulling apart and tearing down such as to make the structure weaker. As Paul told us earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. It, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work. Of what sort it is? This is every believer's work. The material that God's given you to use in the building up of his living temple, called the body of Christ, is your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope. Uh, you might think of these as the yarns that you're to uh, employ in, in your knitting process. You are knitting, <laughs> according to Paul, the picture he painted, whether or not you've ever thought of yourself in that respect. Keep in mind that this is God's building, and he's simply giving, giving you a role to play, a part to contribute when it comes to the building up of the living temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, if you're a believer of Paul's gospel. The evaluation of the stitching you contribute is soon coming. Uh, that evaluation will take place at what is called the judgment seat of Christ, a judgment only for believers, not for heaven or hell, but for reward or the loss of re reward, according to Paul. Your work of faith is only part, it's only one aspect of your edification contribution to God's living temple, the body of Christ. Your patience of hope is the aspect that we've been, uh, been exploring here lately. Let's explore it even further. Spiritual growth is that which leads to spiritual strength. We talked about knitting, didn't we? So spiritual growth is that which leads to spiritual strength. So what part does the believer's patience of hope play when it comes to spiritual maturity, spiritual strength? The Apostle Paul provides the answer in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. And I've said this before, but how many testimony times do you hear you know, that statement being offered? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So where's the Holy Ghost dwelling? In you. I like to think of Romans chapter 8 as Paul's patience of hope chapter. Because in Romans chapter 8, Paul explains what he's just told us there in Romans chapter 5. Tribulation, or circumstances of suffering, is a necessary component in a believer's life when it comes to the development of that believer's patience of hope. Uh, which will be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. You have to have the tribulation to have the experience that leads to patience. Now, as I said, Romans 8 explains this to us. We're going there in just a moment. What brings forth patience again? Paul just told us in Romans chapter 5, the answer is tribulation. If you're seeking more patience, you're asking for tribulation. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but ask for it or not, we're all going to experience it. Along, with, uh, along the pathway of life in these earthly tents in which we now dwell. It's coming our way whether we like it or not. We're talking about situations of suffering that actually test a believer's faith. Our apostle tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above, you, that, ye, above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way of, to escape that ye may be able to do what? Bear it. The Greek word temptation in this passage is a translation of the Greek parasmas, uh, which has to do with a testing or a trial. The context of this passage being that of the testing of a person's faith. Situations of suffering in 
in, li in the life of a believer are certainly able to put the believer's faith to, te uh, to the test, wouldn't you say? It's, it's happened to me. It's happened to all of us. Paul just talked about situations of suffering that put a believer's faith in the, to, to the test. Uh, and he tells us that these situations are common to man. In other words, God isn't bringing these situations of suffering on. Sometimes we'll hear, well, God brought that my way to teach me a lesson. No, he's not bringing these on. These are common to mankind. He isn't causing them, although he knew you'd be facing them. He's not the responsible one for bringing them along. These are trials and tribulations faced by believers and non-believers alike. All men are apt at some point or points in their lives to experience any number of these suffering circumstances. And it takes on so many different flavors that everybody's got their own uh, that they're facing. What is a believer to do? Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and let's fall, uh, find Paul's answer. For starters, Paul talks about believers who suffer with Christ in chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. So let's take a quick look. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, some have suggested that the apostles limiting a believer's joint heirship with Christ to those believers who actually suffer in like manner as Christ suffered. They say, well, we're all heirs, but only the joint heirs are those who suffer. And, of course, those folk put themselves in that category. But I dare say there aren't any believers in this country that I know of that I'm aware of, that have ever undergone suffering in a like manner as Christ suffered. Nor has any believer of whom I'm aware suffered in like manner as the Apostle Paul suffered, for that matter. If you want to see the magnitude of the suffering that Paul endured, just go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and uh, through 30 sometime and look for yourself. Uh, believers have been tortured. We know that. Believers have lost their lives for, for their faith. But see if you can match Paul's list, because so did Paul. But he had much more to undergo before he lost his life. And these things came bef before that time when he said, I offer myself, now I'm ready to be offered as a sacrifice. This helps us gain a, a better perspective of what suffering in like manner as Christ suffered is all about. But Christ suffered even in a greater, to a greater extent than did the Apostle Paul. You say, how so? Christ, think about it, was bearing the weight of the entire human race upon himself at Calvary. And he was separated from the other two members of the Godhead as bearing that weight. The wrath of God was poured out upon his son there as his, the father turned his back on his son. Can you imagine the, the first member of the Godhead turning his back and the second member of the Godhead? My God, my God, both members, why hast thou forsaken me? So he had to bear the weight of all the sin debt of the entire world, every person who ever lived or ever will live, he bore at Calvary. And he took the wrath those sins deserved, and he put it away. That's not what we often hear. We often hear, well, he can put it away, but he hasn't put it away yet. You better do something, and then he'll take it away. He took it away at Calvary, according to Scripture. So let's continue with verse 18, where Paul begins to put his own suffering experiences into perspective. And Paul suffered plenty. For I reckon, verses 18 and 19, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The word manifestations means appearance. Paul obviously had the appearing of the saints in their new bodies in mind when he wrote this. We know that to be the case because Paul's going to tell us that very thing later on in the same passage. It's as though the Apostle Paul was placing all the troubling circumstances that, that caused him such intense suffering in his ministry for the ascended Christ, situations that put his faith to the test, on one side of a table, putting what the patient enduring of those suffering circumstances would mean for him when his new body became his to enjoy on the other side of the table. There wasn't any comparison to be made, Paul said. Paul, Paul's telling us that very thing, to eliminate the suffering situations and not have that new body or to faithfully endure those painful situations and then re realize that new body was a no-brainer for Paul because everybody's going to suffer and Paul knew he, he was included. I'll faithfully endure, loose paraphrase, I'll faithfully endure whatever situations of suffering that have come my way in this life is the idea Paul's setting forth there because my focus is not on this body in this life. My focus is on my new body in the life to come. 
Paul knew what his faithful endurance of the tribulations that might cross his path would accomplish for him at the judgment seat of Christ, where his patience of hope would be evaluated for either reward or the loss of reward, as Paul tells us. Paul also knew about the inner strength that God would provide to enable Paul to endure those troubling circumstances. And who would be responsible for that inner strength? The one who is indwelling, the one who is dwelling, abiding in the living temple, the Holy Spirit. So Paul was saying, bring them on. Bring on the suffering situations. I glory in them. Paul had prayed three times for God to remove the thorn in his flesh that God had given him to keep him from becoming overly prideful due to the abundance of the revelations the ascended Christ was, was sending Paul. But rather than heal Paul when he prayed three times, Christ had a different message for the apostle. Notice that message and Paul's response to that message in this all familiar passage sitting in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, <clears throat> pardon me, my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Scripture has it. Paul's response to that, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The idea when I'm outwardly weak, that's when I can be inwardly strong. Suffering outwardly afforded Paul the opportunity to remain strong inwardly. It also afforded our apostle the opportunity to put his hope on display to those who knew nothing at all but needed desperately to know about Paul's hope. Because Paul knew that suffering in this life would be a common denominator where all men are concerned. He continues in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Vanity in this case does not necessarily mean egotism and arrogance, although the pride of life, which has to do with self sitting on the throne of each of our lives and its resultant desire for self-glorification is a part of the sin nature we've all inherited from, from Adam. However, vanity within the context of the suffering creation Paul's talking about here carries with it the idea of futility, frustration, and disorder rather than order. All brought about by the curse that came as a result of, of Satan's use of the serpent to deceive Eve and Adam knowingly and willingly acquiescing to do what he knew that God had forbidden him to do. And Adam was the federal head of the human race. Who was affected by Adam's decision? The answer is all of creation, as Paul's telling us right here. Every member of creation. A dictionary of the Greek language tells us that the word translated creature in this passage can literally be translated creation. Paul's point is that when Adam sinned, Adam's choice affected not only Adam and Eve, it affected the entire human race, and not only the entire human race, it also affected every creature, every part of creation, apart from humanity. God told Adam, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in Genesis chapter 3. When you plant a garden, how long does it take for you to see the evidence of the effect that Adam's decision in, in Eden had on the plant kingdom? If you've ever planted a garden, you know what I'm talking about. Thorns and thistles would spring up, he was told. Um, watch a documentary sometime on the animal kingdom. The birds, the bees, the fish, the snakes, uh, the animal kingdom overall. And how the food chain works in connection with the animal kingdom. And you'll see how the curse affected all living creatures no matter the kingdom classification. Paul didn't leave any part of creation out when he spoke of the adverse effect that came as a result of Adam's rebellion. Listen to him. Uh, speak about the all-inclusiveness here in verses 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Someone has written that we live in a sighing, sobbing, suffering world. <laughs> well, the reason is because the blight of death is on every living creature. The author of the letter to the Hebrews made the statement, is appointed unto men once to die. That edict had its origin in the Garden of Eden where the process of dying began. 
God told Adam that he was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou eatest, God said, Thereof thou shalt surely die. And the dying process began. This is why the author of the letter to the Hebrews could say it's appointed unto all men once to die. Adam wasn't created as an infant, um, and neither was Eve. What we do know is that the aging process of the man God created and the woman he fashioned from the rib of that man began when Adam chose to disobey his creator. Adam lived nine to 930 years old, according to the pages of Scripture. Many in that day achieved the 9th century mark after Adam. But then after the flood of Noah's day, the longevity of man took a, a steep downturn. The psalmist spoke the, the startling truth of that downturn in Psalms uh, 90, verse 10, where he stated the days of our years are threescore in ten years, so that'd be 70, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore, 80 years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. This is the suffering Paul's talking about. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. The Center for Disease uh, and, uh, Control and Prevention posted their latest statistics, by the way, for the average lifespan of man in general, including women, women, women and men together. They've averaged it all out, and they posted this generic figure in, in this case. And what number do you suppose they, they posted? The answer is 78.8 years. 78.8 years. Some live longer, much longer. Some die much earlier. Generally, women, women live longer than men. But all things taken into consideration, all things averaged together, the lifespan of man is right within the range. The psalmist, being led by inspiration, Holy Spirit inspiration, when he wrote this, posted nearly 3,500 years ago. And it was a 70 to 80 year average. You are going to die is the sad news God told Adam over 6,000 years ago. And, of course, man's been trying to prove wrong, God wrong ever since. Uh, there's seemingly no end to the quest for the fountain of youth. And, and medical scientists are now saying they're right on the verge of being able to reverse the aging process. If you want to see that, go into your computer and Google reverse aging, and it just goes on and on and on and on. You're familiar with the popular country music release uh, of a number of years ago. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> this brings up the question. Does the believer's hope include miraculous intervention when agonizing health issues come our way? Um, after all, we'd expect that if miraculous healings do indeed occur, there would be a far greater number of these miraculous healings taking place for those who profess to be Christians, would there not? than for the non-religious world in general. Have believers been given a pass or a way out of these suffering circumstances in this age of grace? Well, listen to Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. He had just made this statement, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. He's included everyone in this. Now watch what he's going to say next. And not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, or that is to say, the redemption of what? Our body. This is where the suffering hits us. As you recall from our previous lesson, we asked if the believer's hope includes a further, we're hearing a further word from God, which we so often hear today. Well, God told me, God said to do this. But while many would say yes, Paul has told us that God used him to fulfill, meaning to complete, the word of truth for this economy of grace. So if our apostles to be believed, if our Bible is to be believed, those who have believed the gospel of Christ have been given all that we need for life and ministry in God's written word. To expect him to provide a further word on a personal level to us, here or there, is to believe that God's word to man is not complete. He still has further things to say to you, to you, to you. His word to man is not complete. We know it is, because the Bible says it is. Therefore, a further word from God, as we discovered in our previous lesson, is not a part of any believer's patience of hope. Now comes the question, the second question. Would the believer's patience of hope include a patient expectation of miraculous healing in this dispensation of the grace of God? Well, Paul just said that those who have the indwelling Holy Spirit groan within themselves as we wait, underline it, as we wait for that new body where suffering will come to an end. 
Some would point to the fact that miraculous healings were taking place during the course of the Apostle Paul's ministry and that Paul himself was involved in those miraculous healings. Is that true? The answer is yes, it is. <laughs> Let's take a few moments, though, to look at where those miracles were happening and why they were happening. The Apostle Paul was commissioned to do something. He was commissioned to reach both unbelieving Jews and unbelieving Gentiles with the gospel of God first, that's Christ's identity, and then the gospel of Christ, and that's what Christ accomplished at Calvary, where he died for our sins. But what did those non-believing Jews require according to Paul? In his letter to the assembly at Corinth, he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The verb tense in that sentence, in Paul's statement there, is the present tense. In other words, Paul was saying at the time he wrote that, the Jews are requiring a sign. God had always dealt with the Jews, so certainly they required it. God has always, already, he's always dealt with the Jews through the avenues of signs while he was dealing with the Jews as a nation. In fact, dealing with Israel in a visual manner was a part of the law contract itself uh, for those people who, of the nation who had been placed under that law at Mount Sinai. Now, God was reaching out to unbelieving Jews and Gentiles alike through the Apostle of Grace, the Apostle Paul, during a new economy after the law economy had come to a close. But there were still Jews in every quarter, folks, who had been born under that law contract and had never heard the gospel of God, much less the gospel of Christ. So until those Jews had been, who had been born under that law contract had had an opportunity to hear the gospel, God validated the ministry and the message of Paul through the use of signs. Watch, and I'll show you how he did that. Follow Paul's ministry with me through his four apostolic journeys uh, for just a moment. Journey number one, Paul went into Asia Minor. How did God validate the ministry and message of his new apostle? Well, Paul was in Lystra there, where he was stoned, by the way, and he encountered a man who had been lame since birth. This man obviously had never walked. With a loud voice, Paul said, Stand up on thy feet. And the man leaped and walked. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 10. Yes, you can look up that account on your own, as we'll not go into great detail with any of these, and I'll not put them on the overhead for you. But suffice it to, to say that God validated his new apostles' ministry and message in Asia Minor by the use of miraculous signs, a miraculous healing of one who was doing what? Suffering. On Paul's second journey, he traveled into Macedonia. What happened there? Well, you can expect that these folks needed to have Paul's ministry validated to them. Paul encountered a woman whose body had been possessed by an evil spirit, the Bible tells us. That account's found in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18, where we read that Paul cast that evil spirit out of that woman's body. Not to mention the fact that after Paul and Silas were cast into prison, what happened? Anyone tell me? The prison doors were miraculously opened. The cell doors came open. Again, God validated the ministry and the message of his new apostle by way of performing the miraculous in an area that had never heard this, this truth. And there were Jews there that had never heard and had been born under that law contract. After Paul's second journey came his third journey as he went back into Asia Minor, the region of Macedonia, where once again miracles were being performed to validate his ministry and his message. We read of those events in Acts chapter 19, and I know you're not going to remember all the details of all these addresses, but you can ask me later and I can always give you a list. Notice what happened in Asia Minor in verses 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. People who were suffering were being healed simply by having a hanky from Paul mailed to them. And of course that post had to be by camel or something. Uh, but they were being healed. Paul's ministry and his message being validated by God. People who were suffering, suffering was gone. The telling verse is verse 20 where we read, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. During that journey, Paul said, All they which dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Where did Paul go next on his third journey? Well, he went back into Macedonia once again. I'm, I'm sure you'll, you folks will recall the man who fell out of the third floor window after Paul had been preaching into the wee hours of the morning. Someone said the best sermons are the ones that have a great beginning and a great ending and very little in between. <laughs> Evidently, Paul hadn't gotten the message yet, but... 
You suppose that man who fell from the third floor window of that building was suffering bodily? You can read about that in Acts chapter 20, verses 9 through 12. The passage said he was taken up dead. Some have suggested that his fall hadn't actually killed him, perhaps just knocked the breath out of him. Who knows? What we are told is that Paul fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. I hope you're getting the picture here, though. Throughout Paul's apostolic journeys, hope was being realized. Hope was being realized as people were being delivered from their bodily suffering circumstances. Their hope was being realized. Paul's fourth journey took him to Rome, but before he arrived in Rome, we all know that he was shipwrecked just off the coast of an island called Malta. After he arrived on the island, Paul was unharmed. He was bitten by a snake, a viper, the Bible says. It's a poisonous asp. He was bitten by that poisonous viper that had latched onto his hand. Uh, Acts chapter 28, verses 3 and 6. And he simply shook it off into the fire. Don't tell the SPCA. <laughs> but what happened? They thought his arm would begin swelling immediately, and he was totally unfazed. Hope that was realized. Immediately after that, Paul laid his hands on a sick man named uh, Poplius in Acts chapter 28, verses 7 through 8. Not only was the man healed of his bodily infirmity, but verse 9 goes on to say, So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came. And what happened? They were healed. What we've seen during the course of the four journeys of the Apostle Paul through areas where there were Jews who had been born under that law contract but needed to hear the message and God needed to validate the man and his message, we saw bodily infirmity being healed miraculously. Earthly tents, in a manner of speaking, were being restored back to health. However, Paul had not yet reached Rome where he was being taken in order that he might uh, at the very least, be imprisoned. Can anyone tell me the final letter that Paul would write before his house arrest in Rome? The answer to that question is the book of Romans. <laughs> the book where in chapter 8, Paul's been telling us about the suffering creation. And lest we forget, he included believers of the gospel of Christ in that suffering situation. Look back once again at Romans chapter 8, where right after saying, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together unto now, in verse 23, Paul, Paul went on to say, or in 22, he went on to say in verse 23, and not only they, we saw it, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, meaning the redemption of our earthly tents, the redemption of our bodies. According to the Apostle Paul, believers are to be patiently waiting for the deliverance of their bodies from the bondage of corruption. That's a hope that we believers have yet to realize. We groan within ourselves, Paul told us, waiting for that deliverance. What believer would not agree with that statement? This is what the believer's patience of hope is all about. Why did all those miraculous healings cease, we might ask? Why is it that the prayer of faith shall save the sick? Not may heal the sick, not could possibly heal the sick, not just might heal the sick, We'll have to wait and see if it heals the sick. But the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. Why is that not part of the believer's patience of hope today? The answer to that question is found in two places, actually. Take a look at what Paul would write from Rome in the second half of Colossians 1, verse 23, after he had already undergone his journeys where these Jews, uh, born under the law contract, needed a validation of his ministry and message. Watch this in Colossians 1, 23, and we'll read the second half of the verse. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, Paul writes, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. What? Be not moved away from the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to how many? Every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now read the commentaries and they'll all say the same thing. Well, he didn't really mean that. What he meant is it is being preached. That's not the verb tense the Holy Spirit used. Paul had completed his course as his gospel had been proclaimed to every creature which is under heaven according to what the word says. There would be no further need to validate his ministry or his message by way of signs. The second reason why those miraculous sign healings of Paul's day ceased is sitting in verses 24 and 25 of Paul's Romans passage concerning suffering saints. For we are saved 
delivered from our suffering circumstances by what? Hope. But hope that is seen right now, deliverance that is realized in this life, is not hope at all. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, the deliverance from suffering experience in our earthly tents, then do we with patience wait for it. What are we to do in the meantime, Paul? Here it is in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What work? What labor, Paul? We should all know the answer at this point in our studies. Our work of faith, our labor of love, and our patience of hope. The three items of every believer's life that will be open to the scrutiny of the building inspector at the judgment seat of Christ, where the fire, figuratively, shall try every man's work of what sort it is. We all have a part to play, Paul's telling us, in the building up of the living temple called the body of Christ, a holy t habitation of God himself through God the Holy Spirit. It's God's living temple in this age of grace. And how we build our patience of hope is a part of the, the product that we use in our building up, our, our part in building up the living temple. We'll close there for today and we'll pick it up uh, 